Okay, we are looking at our message today from Matthew chapter 24, preparing for the parousia. We're taking a, a brief break from our series on Hebrews. Uh, I'll be back in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, uh, next week. Since uh, John Haller had a chance to minister at a pastor's conference uh, this weekend and would not be teaching during the second hour, uh, I decided that uh, I would actually take this opportunity to uh, build upon two messages that I preached on Matthew 24 earlier this year, dealing with the theme of do not be deceived on the one hand spiritual deception and be alert and ready spiritual preparedness on the other and the Spirit of God laid it on my heart to revisit those two themes but instead of doing overview messages I'm actually going to teach through the entire uh, chapter of Matthew 24 so uh, if you're prone to take notes um, and you get cramps, I apologize in advance. But uh, this is something that I've been working on for several weeks, and the Lord has actually uh, woken me up in the middle of the night uh, two different times uh, this week uh, in preparation for this message. And I uh, am personally uh, excited and encouraged as to uh, what God will do uh, through our two services this morning and through, through these teachings that he has uh, laid upon my heart. So, first of all, we have an introduction. And the English word parousia is actually a transliteration of a Greek word, parousia. The Greek word is parousia, and the English word is parousia. And the word parousia in English most often is used in reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Greek word from which it's transliterated, parousia, has primary meanings of presence, coming, arrival, and advent. And 16 of the 24 times it's used in the Greek New Testament it refers to the future visible return from heaven of Jesus, the Messiah, to raise the dead and set up formally and gloriously the kingdom of God. Now, that leads me to the actual references, and we're not going to look at all of these. Uh, these are all, the, all of the references where parousia in the Greek is used to refer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. More often than not, in these 16 references, it's, it's referring to what we call the, the rapture and the resurrection, rather than the return to the earth to set up his kingdom. The vast majority of these references are dealing with the rapture and the resurrection. And you'll have to allow the context uh, to determine for you uh, which one is in view. But I, I will uh, point out and emphasize before we move from this slide that there's, there's four references in Matthew 24. We'll take a look at two of them in the first hour this morning and then take a look at the second two during the second hour. And there's also four references in the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, which I preached through earlier this year. And in the second, third, fourth, and fifth chapters, it concludes with a verse dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ and the impact that that has in the Christian life. So, before we leave our introduction, I want to emphasize two verses. One from Matthew 24 and one from Mark 13. Mark 13 is Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew 24, 25, Jesus says, Behold, I have told you in advance. 
and he's speaking to his disciples, the same disciples that he would give the Great Commission to less than two months later. The same disciples through whom he would build his church through the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And then Mark's account of that is, but take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. Jesus is warning his disciples about what is coming. And what is coming is going to affect them. And he's letting them know in advance. He wants them to know and understand the answers to the questions that they asked, which prompted this teaching or this uh, discourse that was given on the Mount of Olives. So, that then brings me to my first major point, the setting of Christ's teaching. Now, after Jesus excoriated the scribes and the Pharisees in, in Matthew 23 and then lamented over Jerusalem, knowing that Jerusalem and the temple uh, would be impacted by the unbelief of the scribes and Pharisees, we read these words beginning in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And, and he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now the disciples, they're probably feeling nervous about what Jesus has just said to the religious leaders of Israel. And so, you know how sometimes when people feel awkward or nervous, they say things that maybe don't make a whole lot of sense, uh, maybe aren't the proper thing to say at that particular moment. And so they're talking about architecture. Jesus is talking about spiritual false prophets, and they're talking about temple stones. And Jesus wants his followers to know, his disciples to know, that those stones that they were admiring, those temple buildings that they were admiring, would be torn down. And, and that they would be torn down because of the prophetic word of God. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now this morning, during, during our two hours together, I hope to be, to be able to unpack those two things that are highlighted there in red. The sign of your coming and the end of the age. That is at the heart of the question of the disciples as they came privately to Jesus Christ. Now we're told in, uh, I believe it's Mark's account, uh, the names... Uh, of the four disciples who came and asked uh, that question. So we want to be looking for the sign of Jesus' second coming, and we want to know, we want to look for information regarding the end of the age. Now, can you think of another passage in the book of Matthew where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he mentions this phrase, the end of the age. Can anybody think of a passage in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are the concluding words of Matthew's Gospels. Matthew Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is sharing these words with the same disciples that he gave this teaching to on the Mount of Olives. And so, whatever he means by the end of the age, 
It has something to do with his presence with us as he builds his church and as we follow the Great Commission and make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching people to observe whatsoever he has commanded. All right. We'll have more to say about the sign of his coming and the end of the age in a little bit. Let's take a look at our second main point, and we'll be spending um, a significant amount of, of time in, in this section. It's verses 4 through 26. Now, I'm going to be putting this slide up multiple times. It's not a mistake. It's not an error. It's intentional. I have taken these four verses from, from this particular section and, and, and put them together in order to emphasize the four different times that Jesus warns about spiritual deception. So as we go through verses 4 through 26 and we look at what Jesus teaches in this passage, I want you to know and recognize and understand that Jesus Christ does not want us to be spiritually deceived by the forces of darkness in terms of what he's teaching here. Because he says it four different times. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. He's warning against false Christ. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Warning against false prophets. And then in verse 24, he warns about both false Christ and false prophets when he says, they will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Jesus Christ shares this with his disciples. In response to their question, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And what does he do? He warns them about spiritual deception. That is Satan's main weapon against believers. Spiritual deception. Spiritual deception and then persecution, physical persecution. His identity as the serpent and his identity as the dragon, those are the two focal points with which he aims his attack against believers in Jesus Christ in order to make us ineffective for the ministry of the gospel, in, in order to make us unprepared for the return of Jesus Christ. So it's very, very important that when this slide comes up, you understand that it's on purpose and it's there for a reason and it's Jesus Christ telling us, do not be deceived all the way through these 23 verses. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 6. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. That's not the end of the age. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. The next slide. But the one who endures to the end. Well, the end of what? 
The one who endures to the end of the age. The one who endures to the end of the age, he will be saved or he will be delivered. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. The end of the age will come. And I believe, having studied this passage literally for scores and scores and scores of hours in the last three years. First time I taught on this passage, first time I can remember teaching on this passage was, was a three-week series in an ABF in another church when I substituted for someone that you all know very well. John asked me to substitute uh, for him for three weeks, and I did, a, uh, I did a, 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 an overview teaching of the, of the Olivet Discourse. And I want to tell you, it was about three years ago. I want to tell you that I, I cannot believe how little I knew about the Olivet Discourse when I shared that teaching with that particular class. I'm still learning. I want you to understand that. I don't have all of the answers. I've been studying the text. I've been wrestling with the text. And I am coming to a greater understanding of what I believe Jesus is teaching in this passage. And it's clear to me that the end of the age, the end of the age, is terminated by an event known as the rapture and the resurrection. Does that make sense? When we couple that with the Great Commission? The Great Commission was given to the church, and the church is to make disciples until the end of the age, until Jesus calls us to meet him in the air until the end of the age. Now, there's some dispute as to when the end of that age will occur. Some people put it before the beginning of the 70th seven. Some people put it some unknown time during the second half of the 70th seven. Some people put it at the end of the 70th seven. But I want you to know and understand that it's my, it's my understanding that the end of the age is talking about that period of time which will be concluded with that event known as the rapture and the resurrection. All right. What do we have here? We have Jesus warning, do not be deceived. What doesn't he want us to be deceived about? He doesn't want us to be deceived about false prophets. He doesn't want us to be deceived about tribulation. He doesn't want us to be deceived about spiritual betrayal. He doesn't want us to be deceived about the end. Because there's going to be false shepherds, there's going to be false prophets, there's going to be false Christs, false messiahs. They're going to have false teaching, they're going to have false prophecy. And the, the forces of darkness would like nothing better than to deceive the remnant church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is telling us today, do not be misled. Verse 15, therefore, when you see, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the abomination of desolation, he's talking to the disciples. Now, 
I went to an institution that is dispensational and pre-tribulational. I was taught that the Olivet Discourse was given to the nation of Israel and not to the church. I was taught that the rapture is not described in this passage. That verse 27 through 31 is describing Jesus' return to the earth to set up his kingdom. I taught that view for over 35 years. Having studied the Olivet Discourse in some depth for the last three and a half years, I no longer hold that position. And here's why. In the book of the Revelation, when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, it is describing a singular entity, which Paul refers to as, as the olive tree in Romans chapter 11. God broke off the, the natural branches of the olive tree. He broke off the unbelieving Jews, right? And he grafted in wild olive branches. He grafted in Gentiles into that, into that tree. And whether it's Jew or Gentile that is in that tree, it comes from the same root. And that root is Jesus Christ. It's, it's the, that root is, is represented by the Old Testament unconditional covenants given to the nation of Israel, all three of which were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, or will be fulfilled. Namely, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. When the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, well, let's just take a look at it. Chapter 21. When it comes down out of heaven, verse 12. It had a great and high wall. This is uh, Revelation 21. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels. The names uh, were written on them, which are those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So the New Jerusalem has 12 gates, which are named after the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And then look at verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you've got 12 gates and 12 foundation stones. You've got the 12 tribes, and you've got the 12 apostles. You've got Israel, and you've got the church. I don't believe that the disciples to whom Jesus gave the Great Commission less than two months later were representative of the nation of Israel when he responded to their questions, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I believe that he was talking to those men through whom he would establish his church, through whom he would build his church, through whom the Spirit of God would produce the New Testament. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and who nurse babes in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter on a Sabbath. For then, for then, there will be a great tribulation. When will there be a great tribulation? 
When you see the abomination of desolation, when does that happen? That happens at the midpoint of the 70th seven, according to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. That is undisputed. It happens at the midpoint of that seven year period of time. The abomination of desolation, which requires that there's going to be a third Jewish temple in the city of Jerusalem. And it will be desolated. It will be desolated by the Antichrist and the false prophet. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, when that happens, then there will be a great tribulation. The great tribulation is not all seven years. The great tribulation begins at the midpoint. The great tribulation begins at the midpoint, and it lasts for three and a half years. No place in Scripture that I'm aware of does the Bible ever refer to the 70th seven of Daniel, that seven-year period of time, as the tribulation period. The word tribulation is used generally by Jesus Christ. He told his disciples, in the world, you will have tribulation. You will have tribulation. But there's going to be a great tribulation which will be triggered by this abomination of desolation. And so it will begin at the midpoint. Now, this is really important. Jesus Christ does not want us to be misled or deceived about the abomination of desolation. He does not want us to be misled or deceived about the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation begins at the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation begins at the midpoint of the 70th seven. And he says to the disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation. Know and understand that a time of tribulation is going to come upon the earth such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Reminiscence of the words of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Do not be misled. And then Jesus says, unless those days had been cut short. Well, what days? The days of the Great Tribulation. Unless they had been cut short or limited, no life would, be, would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And there's two ways to look at this. They're either cut short and limited to 1,260 days, or another view is they're going to be cut short and, and they will last for something less than 1260 days. But we know that unless those days had been cut short, the elect would not survive. And because God loves his people, because Jesus Christ loves those who love and follow him, those days will be cut short. In the Greek, you can actually translate this word um, as um, a, a, a verb to amputate. It's lopped off, as it were. So again, do not be deceived. Do not be misled. Those days of the Great Tribulation are going to be limited by God Almighty. Because if they weren't, no flesh would survive. Now, this leads me to my third point, And that is the sign of Christ's coming. It used to be when, when I studied the Olivet Discourse and when I looked at the sign of, of Jesus' coming, because I had this view that Jesus coming uh, in verses 27 to 31 was talking about his return to the earth to establish his kingdom and was not talking about the rapture and revelation, 
I took the sign of his coming to be the abomination of desolation three and a half years before that coming. And the reason that I did that was because that seemed to be the only clear sign that was identified and discussed that had a time reference to it. Well, I have since come to understand that that is incorrect. The abomination of desolation is not the sign of Jesus' coming. Now, I apologize for this slide. I messed up. You know, my wife, she does such great work, and she creates these slides for me, and um, I, I meant to have Matthew 24, 27 to 29, and instead I have Matthew 24, 30 and 31 on this slide. So I don't want you to look at the, the words on the slide. I want you to look at your Bibles, and if you're watching this live stream or you're watching it on the YouTube channel, uh, on our, our, our archives, you need to get out a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to take a look at verses 27, 28, and 29. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Jesus Christ does not want us to be deceived. When He comes, He will come quickly. He will come in a moment in time. He will come like a flash of lightning. There will not be any time to prepare after He comes. If you're going to be prepared, if you're going to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ, you need to be ready ahead of time because there are no do-overs. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Wow, what an incredibly enigmatic Hebrew proverb in the middle of the Olivet Discourse. Now, for those of you who have done word studies and, and, and who have actually searched the scriptures for similar passages to this, you have discovered that this, this phrase actually occurs in one other place in the entire Bible, and that's in Luke chapter 17. And we're going to take a look at that during the second hour this morning. Luke chapter 17. Where... The corpses, there the vultures will gather. And I think what this means is that wherever there is spiritual corruption and rebellion, judgment is sure to follow and congregate. So what is Jesus Christ saying? Jesus Christ is saying that when he returns for his church, when he returns for his church, he is going to meet them in the air. And he's going to deliver them from the wrath to come. That's a promise to us. First, First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. He delivers us from the wrath to come. We are not going to face the day of the Lord. That verse about corpses and vultures, that's talking about the day of the Lord. When Jesus Christ returns for his church, the day of the Lord will immediately follow. Now, how do I get that out of this passage? I don't. But I will show you why I interpret it that way in the second hour. So, if you want to know, don't leave. <laughs> Come back the second hour, okay? How's that for a great tease? I'm telling you, from, from the Word of God, I can make that connection. That, that the day of the Lord, the wrath of God, begins on the very day 
that Jesus Christ raptures the church and meets them in the air. Raises the dead in Christ and then raptured, raptures those who are alive and remain along with those who have, have died in Christ and will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And once that event happens, the day of the Lord will come on that day. It will be triggered. It will be unleashed. There will be no escape. And the world who will witness Jesus Christ in the air, this is a public event that's being described in Matthew chapter 24. It's a public event. And the nations of the earth are going to mourn. And why are they going to mourn? Because they don't believe in the Messiah. They're going to mourn because the day of the Lord is going to come upon them. God's wrath is going to overwhelm them because of their unbelief, because of their rebellion, and because of their rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24, a few verses earlier? That the gospel of Jesus Christ would go out to the entire world, and then the end would come. The end of the age. And the end of the age includes the church, if I understand the Great Commission correctly. But I'll connect those dots for you in the second hour. Look at verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation of what days? Immediately after the tribulation, immediately after the, the tribulation known as the great tribulation. Something's going to happen. Jesus says, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And that cosmic disturbance, it's a cluster of cosmic events that is clear and unmistakable. It's not a mere lunar eclipse. It's not a mere solar eclipse. We've got the sun turning dark. We've got the moon not giving, giving its light. We've got the moon turning into blood in other passages. We've got stars falling from the sky. We've got powers of the heavens being shaken. In, in two other passages, it says that the sky is actually rolled back as a scroll, and it reveals the throne room of heaven to the inhabitants of the earth. This is a clearly public event. It's not secret. It's public. Now, wow. That clock is quick. <laughs> All right. We're actually almost done, so not to worry. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through a series of passages dealing with that phrase that I just read in uh, Matthew chapter 24 and, and verse 29. Uh, it's a quotation of Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. I want you to pay close attention. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before, before, underline that word, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. This event happens before the day of the Lord. Do you see that? Those cosmic disturbances that will be seen by the inhabitants of the earth, clear and unmistakable, those things happen prior to the day of the Lord. Now, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul tells us in no uncertain terms that the day of the Lord does not begin until sometime during the second half of the 70th seven. 
It's after the abomination of desolation. It's after the man of lawlessness takes his seat in the temple, displaying himself as being God. So when Jesus quotes from Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, and he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, it's prior to the day of the Lord. Do you see do you see how this makes me very uncomfortable? Do you see how I have to wrestle with these passages, knowing how I was taught by godly men for whom I have great respect? Matthew 24, 29, Mark 13, 24, 25, that's Mark's account of the Olive Discourse, Luke 21, 25, and 26, all are citations of Jesus Christ of the verse in Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. Peter then, on the day of Pentecost, quotes Joel 2, 30, 31, and the first part of 32. And what's the first part of 30, or the last part of uh, uh, 32? First part of 32. It will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He who endures to the end will be delivered. That's what Jesus is talking about in that passage. Joel chapter 2, verse 32, the first part of the verse. It will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. Will be saved. And then John also alludes to this phenomenon in Revelation chapter 6. And I'd like to actually turn in your Bibles to Revelation 6. This is the sixth seal. This is not at the end of the 70th seven. It's not at the beginning of the 70th seven. Verse 12 and following, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood. This is Joel 2, 30 and 31. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, the rich, the strong, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has arrived. Okay, it, it hasn't come yet. Okay, it's about to be poured out. It's about to be unleashed. The day of the Lord will be triggered by these cosmic events. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? All of these things fit together, people. We cannot bring our presuppositions to the Bible and fit individual verses and passages into our theological systems. We dare not do that. If we do that, we are in danger of being deceived. We have to allow the scriptures to speak for themselves. We have to allow the Spirit of God to illumine our hearts and our minds and tell us the truth. We must interpret scripture with scripture and not bring a theological system to the table. Now, there's some great theological systems out there, right? Some of you might be proponents of one or more of them. But know and understand this. Theological systems are man-made. Are they infallible? What? Are they infallible? No! Good heavens, no! Are they inerrant? No! Are they authoritative? 
No, they're just interpretations. They're man's best effort at understanding what the Word of God says, but they are not the Word of God. That is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. We must, we must approach the Word of God with humility and fear. Asking God to help us understand these things because they are difficult to understand. This slide I got right. <laughs> I'm going I'm to show you something here. I want, you, I want you to at least be open to this passage being a reference to the rapture. I want you to look at the language in these two verses. Two verses. Look at the language. Look at what it says. Then the, son of, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the what? Sky. sky. Underline sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they're going to see the Son of Man in the sky. And what's his sign? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. It's probably going to be his Shekinah glory blinding everybody on planet earth. He's going to reveal his glory when he returns. It's going to be a glorious return, Titus 2.13 tells us. Every pre-tribulationalist I know believes Titus 2.13 is talking about the rapture. So do I. It's going to be a glorious return. It's not a secret return. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the what? The clouds of the sky. Underline clouds, underline sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. Is this starting to sound familiar to anybody? You're up in the air. You've got a trumpet. You've got angels. You've got Jesus Christ. Sound familiar? 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Anybody, anybody see any familiarity or pattern here? I sure do. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the what? The four winds. This is not a gathering on the earth. This is a gathering in the air. From one end of the sky to the other. Is it beyond the realm of possibility that this could possibly be talking about the rapture and the, res and the resurrection in light of the language being used? It's possible. I believe that. And if you give it its normal, natural reading, I would think some might conclude that it is talking about the rapture. Unless there's something in the passage which would definitely preclude us from taking that approach and position. Okay. I got all excited, and you know what? I buried the line. <laughs> Is that the phrase when you, when, you, when you mess up, when you're writing an, an article for the newspaper, you bury the line? You bury the lead. Yeah, you bury the lead. Yeah, that's it. I buried the lead. Okay, here's what I should have done. <laughs> I got all excited and ramped up, and I apologize. But, again, my wife did such a great job with this. Then the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Wow, by doing it ahead of time, I got to do it twice. I actually like that. <laughs> All right. 
So, before I pray, here's what Jesus is doing. He's preparing his followers for the, for the parousia. He's preparing his followers for his second coming. He wants them to not be spiritually misled. He wants them to not be spiritually deceived. Next hour, we'll find out that he wants them to be spiritually prepared, alert, and ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this section of your word. Father, I pray that you would take it and bless our hearts, challenge us, Father, as we study it on our own, and as we seek to learn what it means and make sense of what your word teaches regarding the return of your son. Father, please help us to not be misled by the forces of darkness. Help us to not be spiritually deceived. Father, help us to go to the text and the text alone. And Father, as we conclude in prayer, I want to thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he arose the third day, according to the scriptures, so that any who call upon his name might be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you would give us boldness to share that message with those that we come in contact with. Father, for those that don't yet know your Son, the Lord Jesus, by faith, we pray that they might repent of their sins, turn from their sins, and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen.